of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 40 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Today, Andrew illustrates the power of God's Word to change our lives in his teaching, The Word Became Flesh. Now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing a series that I've been on. This is now my third week that I've been teaching on The Word Became Flesh. That's what I've titled this entire teaching. It's actually a five-part teaching that I taught at a Gospel Truth seminar in Fort Worth, Texas in November of 2007. I've already covered a lot of material, and um, I'm dealing now about why Jesus had to become a physical human being. I tell you, that is a powerful truth right there. And how it came to pass that he became a physical human being. Uh, as I've said on our programs before, I'm teaching all of this in a sequence. And what I taught last week is really essential for understanding the things that I'm talking about this week. So I encourage you to please get those materials. Even if you've heard this teaching, I tell you, it would be good for you to be able to have this and go back over it again. So I really am pushing this teaching that I did. There's five parts to it entitled, The Word Became Flesh, and it would be a blessing to you. Yesterday, uh, we ended our program with me reading some verses from Luke chapter 1 about the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's go back. We only read a couple of these verses. But in Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I commented on this quite a bit yesterday, but if you don't have a Bible that says that Mary was a virgin, if it just presents her as a young maid or a damsel, then you need to get rid of that virgin because this is a, it's like a nail that everything else in the Christian faith hangs upon. If Jesus was only a man, then his life wasn't worth more than just one other man's life. But if Jesus was God in the flesh, which is what this virgin birth is signifying, then his life was worth more than the entire human race. And this is just a non-negotiable truth that you have to believe. You know, if anybody believes that Jesus was just somehow or another an exalted man, a godly man, well then you have missed the whole point. That is not true. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Jesus isn't just a way to God. Jesus wasn't just a representative of God that somehow or another pointed towards God. Jesus was God in the flesh. You know, there's so many things in the Scripture that teaches on that. I could spend a week just going through Scriptures and establishing that, but that is a principle that is taught and is non-negotiable in the Word of God, and that's what this virgin birth refers to. So in verse 28, it says, And the angel came in and said unto her, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women." And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. You know, this is kind of a sideline, but this has always uh, amazed me that God in his dealings with mankind has been super gracious and merciful unto us. There's many times that angels have appeared unto people and nearly every single time people recoil in fear when they come into the presence of some kind of an angelic being and they have fear come on them and the angel always has to say, fear not. And so in this instance, here is the angel saying that you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And Mary was shocked at this and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. In other words, she was trying to figure out, you know, what kind of a greeting is this? And it's amazing, but we have become so separated from God and so conditioned in our thinking that God is angry at us that if, you know, this angel Gabriel would have appeared and said, Mary, you scum, you sorry thing, God is here. Well, she would have said, boy, this is God. She would have accepted that. But when you have an angel come and start saying that you're highly favored, that you're blessed, that you're beloved of God, man, people are shocked at this kind of a response. You know, people have just been conditioned to accept 
that God is ticked off. But here is the angel coming to Mary and, and speaking these positive things to her. And in verse 30, it says, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Now, you know, there are different ways that you can ask questions. Questions are really a powerful way to gain understanding, but it depends what you mean by it. Like, for instance, this same angel, Gabriel, appeared unto Zacharias and in, in the same chapter of uh, Luke chapter 1 and told him, that he and his wife would finally conceive and have a child in their old age. And he says, how can this be? Now, see, that's a question. But it was a question that arose from unbelief. It was a statement of unbelief like, how could this be? We're both past childbearing age. And because of this, this same angel, Gabriel, was angry and struck Zacharias dumb. And he wasn't able to speak until John the Baptist was born. Well, here's Mary asking a question, and yet you don't get any of that same response from Gabriel. And so I believe that by the response that Gabriel gave to Mary, it shows that she wasn't saying, how can this be like a statement of unbelief? She was accepting what the angel was going to tell her, but she was just asking a question for clarification. She was engaged to Joseph. And she was just asking, how's this going to be? Am I supposed to go ahead and consummate the marriage with Joseph? And is this the way that this child is going to come? She was asking for clarification. You know, if Abraham would have asked the angel that spoke unto him and says, how is this going to be? Is this going to be through Hagar, my wife Sarah's maid? Because Sarah and him had been trying for decades and had been unable to have children. And eventually, after the Lord spoke to him that he was going to have this miraculous child born to him in his old age, they just supposed it was going to be through Hagar, Sarai's maid. And so they went ahead and had this child and started the whole Arab-Israeli conflict came out of this. We wouldn't have had this problem today if Abraham would have asked a question and said, how's this going to happen? Am I going to uh, have a relationship with Hagar? See, uh, Mary wasn't asking this question out of disbelief or unbelief. She was just asking for clarification. How's this going to be? She was a virgin. She had had no relationship. Was she supposed to go ahead and consummate the relationship with Joseph? And no, here's what the angel said in verse 35. The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Man, that is a powerful statement. And you know, one of the other translations, I forget exactly right now uh, which translation it was, but one of the translations of this 37th verse says, for no word of God is without power of fulfillment. In other words, basically, here's the explanation that Gabriel gave unto Mary. He said, Mary, the way this is going to happen is that the Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you and the Holy Spirit is going to supernaturally impregnate you, not with the seed of a man, but with the word of God. And then he says, for no word of God is without power of fulfillment. And Mary humbled herself. And in this next verse, verse 38, Mary said, behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now you're going to have to follow me here for just a moment. You know, most people want to watch television and have somebody kind of just fire them up and get them in excited and do something and you can feel a goose bump and they don't want to use their brain and have to think. But you're going to have to think just a moment to get the point that I'm making, but it's well worth the effort. When Mary said, how is this going to happen? Basically, the angel came and took all of the prophecies that had been given in the Old Testament 
and said the Holy Spirit is going to take these words that had been spoken by God and these words are going to be implanted on the inside of you and the Word of God is going to become the sperm that produces this seed and he is going to be called the, the um, Son of God. And Mary said, So be it unto me according to thy word. She opened her heart up and received this prophecy from Gabriel. And I believe that that's how she conceived the Lord Jesus. Now here's the significance of all of this. If you'll go back to the teaching that I was making last week about how God spoke everything into existence. He created the worlds by His words. He created all the plant life, the animal life, and man by saying, let us make man in our image. Everything, every physical body was created and spoken into existence. But when, after God had created this universe and the world and man, He turned the control and the dominion over this earth over to physical human beings. And therefore, when he wanted to himself become a man and come down so that he could take back this power and authority that we had lost, that we had turned over to Satan, he had to become a man to be able to do this. I used that verse yesterday on my program out of uh, J uh, John chapter 5 where Jesus said that he had power or authority to execute judgment also because he was the Son of Man, because of his physical body. God had to become physical because he had only given control over this earth to beings that had a physical body. So God had to become physical. And the way he created the first physical body of Adam was he spoke it into existence. But now he didn't have direct control over the earth anymore. So he couldn't just speak the second Adam into existence. That's what Jesus was called in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So how did God accomplish this? What he had to do, he had to communicate with human beings in their heart. This is the way that God communicates with us is through our spirit being. And he communicated and inspired us. And then people with physical bodies had to speak forth these things to create the second Adam or to create that body for God to inhabit. And the problem with this was that there was no one person who was operating on God's level. We had all become corrupted. We had all become sinful. We had all been defiled. And you know what? It literally took 4,000 years and dozens or maybe even hundreds of people being inspired by God, people that had physical bodies speaking forth these inspired words to create this body for the Lord Jesus to inhabit. Now, I hope you can follow that logic. God spoke the first Adam into existence. He had to speak the second Adam into existence, but he was no longer in soul control and dominion over the earth. He had turned that over to physical human beings. So instead of God just speaking Jesus into existence the way he spoke Adam into existence, he had to inspire people with physical bodies who had to speak forth these inspired words. And the problem was that no one person could wrap his brain or his heart around everything that need, needed to be said. Let me just give you a couple of examples. There's, you know, there was a lot of prophecies spoken in the Old Testament about uh, Jesus. But here's one in Isaiah chapter 7, Isaiah 7, 10. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God, ask it either in the depth or in the height above. Uh, but Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye also weary God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and to choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and to choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. And it goes on. And, and anyway, there's a lot of prophecies right here. But just think about this. 
Here is a minister of God, Isaiah, and he is inspired by God, and he speaks this out of his mouth. He says, here's a sign that God's going to give you. A virgin is going to conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel. And the word Emmanuel means God with us. Now, just think about this. Say, for instance, you know, I've delivered prophecies to people. I've spoken things to people. I remember a woman came to one of my meetings, and I called her out and said, God wants to minister to you, and you know what? God just gave me her name. I'd never seen this woman before, but the Lord told me this woman's name, and I said, your name is, and I spoke out what this woman's name is. You know what? I can tell you on my part, it took a lot of faith for me to take that impression that I had, this thought that I had, and say that this is God, because I mean... Uh, you're putting yourself on the line. What if her name hadn't have been what I called out? Right now, I forget what it was, but I was inspired. I called it out, and it turned out that, yes, that was that woman's name, and you know what? She knew that I'd never seen her before, and because of that, immediately, she just opened up her heart to everything I had to say, and God spoke to her, and this woman was miraculously set free. But it took a lot of faith to tell a person, this is your name, when I didn't have a clue in just the natural realm what their name is. Think what it would be like to stand up and prophesy and say, a virgin is going to conceive and bear a son, and his name will be God with us. It'll be God coming into the flesh. Man, I can't even wrap my brain around that. That is such a far out there prophecy. And you know what? I believe that this is the reason that it took approximately 4,000 years for the Lord to speak through multiple different people, everything that needed to be spoken for Jesus' physical body to be created because it was just God, you know, when he was in control of things totally on his own, he just spoke and said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness and let them have dominion. Just a couple of sentences, but it was so anointed, there was zero unbelief, there was zero problems in it because God... His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's just so infinitely greater than we are that a couple of sentences from God when he's in absolute control and boom, Adam's body was fully created. But to speak through people, people could just grab a little tiny bit. They had to prophesy. I think it was Malachi that prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. That had to be spoken. It had to be spoken that he would be wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Isaiah spoke that. Isaiah had to prophesy about how that Jesus would become uh, our atonement for us and how he would bear our sicknesses and carry our diseases. He would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and all of these things that are prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. See, God had to speak through Moses. Moses gave a prophecy about that God's going to raise up a prophet unto you like unto me, but him you will hear. And every one of these people, there were prophecies given all the way through the Old Testament, and they were spoken by man. Now remember that God created the first Adam by words. Here he wanted to bring the second Adam, as Jesus is called over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He wanted to create the second Adam. He likewise had to speak him into existence, but he had to speak through people, through prophets. It took 4,000 years, dozens and dozens of different prophets speaking, inspired by God, prophesying these things that had to be spoken under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to be able to produce this physical body. And then you know what happened when Gabriel appeared unto Mary and she said, how is this going to be? Basically, he says, we're going to take all of these prophetic words, these prophecies, these words inspired by God and spoken through the mouths of somebody who had a physical body. And the Holy Spirit is going to take these words and impregnate you with them. Now, I know that this terminology may be different than what you're thinking, but uh, here's another verse that would verify this over in 1 Peter. In chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. This scripture says that the word of God is an incorruptible seed. And the exact Greek word that is used here is the word spora, 
talking about a physical seed that you plant in the ground, but the word spora comes from the word sperma in the Greek, which is talking about a sperm. And so you could use it either way. The Word of God is like a seed that is planted in the ground, or you could say it's like the sperm of a man. And really, the virgin birth of Jesus was totally natural in every respect except one, and that is that a man didn't provide the seed. God's Word was the seed. The Holy Spirit took all of these prophetic utterances that had been uttered over thousands of years. And when Mary said, So be it unto me according to thy word, she humbled herself and received the word of God. And the Holy Spirit took these prophecies, these divine utterances, and impregnated Mary with it, and the word became flesh. That's what it says in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh. Man, once you understand the things that I've been saying here today, this gives an understanding about it that I believe could help you to radically see why it took so long for Jesus to show up and why things had to happen the way they did. Why did God have to become a man? Because God had delegated the authority over this earth to physical human beings. And when we gave that authority and power to the devil, God, in a sense was uh, it would have been unjust to come down here and intervene in our affairs when he told us, you rule it, you subdue it, you do whatever you want to. Man did what they wanted to do. We gave control of this earth over to Satan, and God would have been unjust to come down here and have just stopped Satan. And so what happened was God himself had to become a man. He had delegated this authority to physical human beings. God had to gain a physical body to be able to come and deal with the devil. And now the devil was hurting for certain because God no longer was just on the outside looking in. God had become a man. God became one of the hostages. And now he was able to deal with Satan on a level because he had authority in this physical earth because of that physical human body that he took. Man, that's powerful. And I've got a lot of other things that this has now just provided a foundation so that we can talk about some really important things. I'm going to continue this on my program tomorrow, so I encourage you to listen in then. Also, you need to get this teaching entitled, The Word Became Flesh. I really believe that. This is a powerful, powerful teaching that would answer a lot of questions, give you direction about how to receive from God, and it would be a blessing to you. Our announcer is going to give you information about this entire album, about the free teaching that we're offering today, and please call or write today and request these materials. Andrew's five-part teaching titled, The Word Became Flesh, was captured live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available in a CD or DVD album for a gift of 16 pounds or more. For the CD album, ask for number T1057 or request the DVD series T3202. You can also get Andrew's teaching as seen on TV by asking for DVD album number T1057 when you send a gift of 16 pounds or more. The third teaching in the audio CD album is also available for a donation. We encourage everyone to send a gift, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this third CD free of charge. Request teaching number TC24 when you write or call and we'll be pleased to send it to you. The best way to reach us is through our website. You can order ministry materials online 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. Or you can use your credit card to order by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922-473-300. Again, that's 01922-473-300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code then 44-1922-473-300. Helpline hours extend from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you prefer to write us, our address is AWME. 
That's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. We hope to hear from you today. I want to thank those of you who are partners with us and who give beyond just, you know, the amount of money that it takes to get the products, the materials that you get. But, you know, it's our partners that have made us so that we can be on television around the world sharing these truths. People's lives all the way around the world today have been impacted by these truths that I've talked about. And I just want to thank those of you who are partners. We have a number on your screen that you can call. There are different partnership levels. Uh, the uh, people at our phone center will give you more information. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events and let the Word of God transform your life. He'll be in Kampala, Uganda, July 11th and 12th. He'll also be in the Northwest Province of South Africa on July 20th and July 21st through the 23rd. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, call our helpline or visit our website at awme.net. I know that many of you get blessed by these programs, but they're just little 30-minute programs. Did you know on our website, you can get my material 24-7, and I have over 400 different teachings available as free downloads, MP3, or you can listen to them right there on the web. We have seven years' worth of my television programs, 10 years' worth of my radio programs. I've got books, articles, just a wealth of information. If you are being ministered to by this, I think that our website would be a tremendous resource for you. So please join us. The address is there on the screen and check out our website 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more gospel truth. God himself even operated under the spiritual laws that he put down. He said that he could not lie. He said that whatever comes out of his mouth is a binding contract. And even when mankind took the power and the authority that God had given them for good to rule the earth and used it incorrectly and yielded that authority to the devil and made him the God of this world, God would not violate his word. He said people with physical bodies have authority and God himself did not violate that. He always had to have a person to flow through. But the problem was that no person could yield to him completely. And so therefore, God had to become a man. You aren't going to just see things happen uh, miraculously, independent of all of the spiritual laws that God has placed down. God himself operated within the constraints of the commands that he had given us. God himself had to become a man before he could buy back this dominion that had been given over to Satan. And it took thousands of years for God to find people who would have enough faith and boldness to speak out his prophecies and bring things to pass. If God himself had to operate this way, then there are limits on what God can do.